Hello everybody, Adam Lusek here, and today we're going to be going over diffusion models. The ones that we've been seeing that can create images, audio, video, and many other things from seemingly nothing, just text prompts. There have been a lot that have been making the rounds and producing some really good stuff. We've seen Sora really take off with a lot of their cool things. Recently I've been seeing a lot of posts from Luma Labs and their Dream Machine video generator. The other day I was messing around with Eleven Labs text to speech, making me be able to speak Polish. To jest przykład bardzo długiego zdania, aby pokazać jak brzmi w dłuższej formie. Sounds just like me, it's some cool stuff. And image generation models like Dolly that we've got here have been around for a while now. These models are super cool, but they work a little bit differently from the classic, you know, text-based large language models that we usually think of when we think of these Gen AI machine learning models. So I wanted to break down exactly how they work at a very broad intuitive level, and then also put some to the test with some of the recent stable diffusion releases. And so the best way to really get a good understanding of how diffusion models work is to start directly from the top, going over how the training data is actually made, what the model is trained on and what it does, and then also how the model is able to generate post-training. And so for our breakdown, we're going to be using the example of an image diffusion model or an image generation model, sim similar to things like mid-journey, stable diffusion, etc. And then how this general process is also applied to stuff like audio and video a little bit later. And so really it starts with three main steps. The data preparation phase for image generation models is called the forward diffusion step. And that's taking a perfectly clear image and then over a series of steps, adding noise or distorting this image almost. So we see a quick example here of what that looks like. Then this is all before the actual model itself is introduced. And then what the model is actually trained on is being able to go from these steps where the noise is added and predict what the added noise is to each one of these images over these series of steps. And so once it's able to actually predict the noise that's being added, what you can do is reverse that process into what is called reverse diffusion, which is essentially going to be where the actual generation step is going to take place. Being able to take pretty much nothing, just random noise, and then from that iteratively predict based on sort of some input, maybe like a text prompt of a dog per se, and then iteratively sort of predict which noise should be removed then instead of predicting what should what was added. And through this process, it'll go through and create a clean image. Obviously, we'll be breaking down all of this into further detail at each step, but just to give a little high level and fun sort of example that I thought of when putting this together was that forward diffusion is almost like, you know, this clip from Marvel's Endgame where good old Tom Holland here is blasted into nothingness and sort of becomes dust. And so that's almost a way of thinking about the forward diffusion process. And then the reverse diffusion process is being able to take that nothingness and random dust and then put it back into something with actual structure. So just a interesting way of looking at it from a top level. So to kick things off into our first step, forward diffusion. So the forward diffusion step is a series of steps where noise is incrementally added to original data. For the example of image diffusion models, this would be images. And so it looks a little bit like this, where over a series of steps, it slowly becomes more distorted, distorted, and distorted until it becomes almost nothing, just pure noise. And so noise in this case, when we usually think of just random noise, we might think of something like white noise, but how do you display white noise in sort of like an actual picture process? That would be Gaussian noise here. And so you can think of Gaussian noise almost like, you know, TV static. And what's actually happening when your TV gets static is some sort of noise being added to the signal. The signal is clear, but with this noise, it adds sort of this buzz, which might be the white noise from your speakers or the not so clear signal, which might be the Gaussian noise here. And the main purpose of really adding noise to these images is to create a sequence of sort of increasingly noisy versions of the data. And this data is what will sort of eventually become the training data that the underlying neural network coming up in the next step will actually be trained on to both recognize and remove the noise in later the final reverse diffusion step. So this is a bit of a quick visualization of how that might be added. And if you're wondering how the noise is added, it's almost purely mathematical. I'm not going to go too into the mathematics of how these things are set up, but just know that 
That's sort of what's happening. It's all being calculated behind the scenes with some fancy math. So to give a general process overview and summary, really all that's happening here with the images is we're starting with sort of the original and clean data and incrementally over a number of steps. In this example of my face, this is only about five steps. You're going to add small amounts of noise. So then you're going to have these sequences of images that progressively get noisier and noisier. And then finally, you're going to be ending with very highly noisy data. And it's, I did add the noise to this myself. And sometimes if you zoom out, you can actually see this a little bit better. But you can see that this is all just a lot of noise being added. And I am pretty much unrecognizable here. Just pure randomness at the end. Some of the key points to remember here is that this actually isn't like a model manipulating these images. This is sort of a preset procedure for adding noise to the data that's done mathematically. And there's no, you know, specific machine learning or anything that happens here. It's just taking the images and progressively adding noise. This is also a very predefined step. And so the amount of actually steps of adding noise to the data is predefined and also not learned by sort of the model in the, in the upcoming next step or any model. In this example, it's only five steps, but generally, as we saw, you know, with this process overview, it can be upwards of, you know, thousands of different steps of this happening. And then finally, having the different examples of images with noises at different steps is super crucial because this then becomes our training data that we're going to plug in to actually train our neural network based model in the following step on all of this data to then be able to predict the noise that's being added. So let's hop over to the second step, model training. Great, so as we just mentioned, the actual goal of training the neural network model is to end up with a network that can actually predict what noise has been added to an image from the data that has been created through our forward diffusion. So this is where we're gonna start to see why we're iteratively over many steps actually adding noise to the data. Because at each step, what we can do is use that as training data to then predict what noise is being added. And so this is where all the fun, you know, machine learning and neural network training is going to come into play. Because to get a model or some sort of algorithm that can accurately predict what noise is being added, given these input images, what we're going to have to use is a neural network and train it on all of this. So what that sort of looks like is you're going to start with sort of those sequence of images that over some amount of steps that you have, have had the noise added to them. So that might look like this. In our prior example, that might look like this. Or, you know, in the case of myself, that might look like this. And then what we're going to do is train the model to look at these inputs here and then generate sort of the predicted noise of what's been added to the image from the previous step. So it's going to look at these and then sort of here on the right is what it expects the actual noise was added to this image from this step to this step. And so that's sort of the basic gist of it. The optimization of the model comes from actually the loss function here, which what it'll do is it'll compare the predicted noise that the model as it's learning is predicting, so all of this stuff on the right, to the actual noise that was added at each step here, and then it'll tune all of those internal weights and biases and update them over all of these steps to be able to sort of accurately predict then at each step what noise has been added. And so this process is really repeated across sort of many different images at many different noise levels to then accurately train the network across a very wide range of conditions leaving us with a network that has learned to very or mostly accurately predict the noise that's been added for different levels of, you know, corruption or sort of noisy images or however you want to understand what's going on here. So to give a general summary and process overview of this, we first start with the sequence of images that over some amount of steps have had the noise added to them. Then what we're going to do is for each step, provide this neural network with the noisy images at that step. And then through this, we're going to train the network to predict the exact noise or roughly close enough that was added to create that noisy image from the previous step. We then do the loss calculation by comparing the predicted noise to the actual noise added and calculate the loss there. And then from that loss, we use it to update the network's parameters, improving its abilities as it learns to sort of predict the noise from these images at each steps. And so then the final action is that in being able to actually predict the noise, what we can do is almost completely reverse this process and remove noise 
from sort of, you know, some arbitrary noisy start to hopefully do some sort of actual diffusion-based generation. And so that brings us to the third step or where stuff is actually being generated through these diffusion models, the reverse diffusion process. And so the hope at this step is that once the models actually train pretty well on predicting the noise that's being added to the images at these different steps, what we can do then is with the predicted noise, reverse this process and actually predict what noise has been added and then subtract it from the steps in an iterative process. And so this will actually be able to remove the noise from an image. And since it's being trained on all sorts of different you know, conditions and different media, what we can do is have it predict for those different conditions and hopefully generate something at the end that's a clean, non-noisy image from a starting place of noise. I've got an example here of what that sort of looks like. So starting from the noise here, the model will predict what noise has been added in this image, subtract it, and then starting from this step, predict, subtract, predict, subtract, and then over all these steps, finally go from lots of noise to a nice clean image, which in this case is a strawberry. And so I've got a few, you know, live GIF examples of this actually in action. And just to go over the process once more quickly, there's just the prediction, the subtraction, and the repetition of this. Prediction is, you know, the network takes the noisy image, predicts the noise component, then you subtract the predicted noise from the current noisy image to obtain a less noisy image, and then this is just repeated iter iteratively, gradually transforming the noisy image into a realistic image. So we can see how that's actually going on here for like the top of a house, maybe a rib cage x-ray, and then this pretty cute cat going from noise. And then as each step goes on, the noise is subtracted out and out and out for an image to actually be generated. And so that's really all three of the main steps all at once, specifically for image generation models. And so just to provide a final sort of summary of all three steps at once, we start with the forward diffusion process where we take an original image and deliberately sort of add some random noise to it iteratively over different steps. This will make these images go from clear to progressively distorted or fuzzy at the end. And we do this step by step, adding more noise each time, creating a series of images then that go from clear to very noisy. The second part is then the model training, which is where the model is learning to identify the noise. And the neural network is sort of shown these noisy images and is asked to figure out what the noise looks like. Essentially, it'll learn then to recognize the patterns of noise that were added to each image. For example, if you take a clean image of a cat and then add some of the noise to it that makes it look grainy, the neural network will then learn to see the graininess and understand it as noise and be able to predict what that is. And then finally, you have the reverse diffusion or the denoising process, where once the network is actually good at identifying what the noise looks like, it can then do the reverse take a noisy image and then predict what the image would look like without that noise. Or in other words, if you give it, if you give the network sort of a noisy picture, it can figure out how to sort of clean it up by removing the noise that it has learned to recognize. And in doing this, it's actually able to generate something net new. Sweet. So now that we have a general understanding of what the forward diffusion model training looks like, and then the reverse diffusion and actual creation process is, Let's dive into sort of how this looks with something other than images, both audio and video. So let's start first with how audio diffusion models differ from image generation models. And the good news here is that they follow almost sort of the exact same process, just using audio data now. So starting with the first part, you've got the forward diffusion. And instead of taking a picture, you start with sort of a clean audio segment. So you can take a sample such as a segment of speech or music. So for this example, we're going to be using a piano sound that sounds like this. Lovely. And so what we did with images once we had the clean image is we distorted it with sort of Gaussian noise. But since now we're working with audio, what we can actually use is something like white noise. So white noise sounds not very pleasant, but a little bit like this. I won't play too much of that, but what you can do then is iteratively and step-by-step step add white noise to your original waveform to create a distorted noise. So adding the white noise to our piano sound then sounds like this.
And so over and over, you can see that this is becoming more distorted and more distorted. And eventually, similar to what we did with images, we'll have clean all the way through to almost purely noise by the end of it. The model training part then is very similar as well. Taking those you know, iteratively added noise steps of the audio, the machine learning model will then learn at each step to be able to predict what noise has been added to that audio sample. And using all that fun stuff of optimizations and loss functions, we'll become pretty good at being able to do that. The reverse diffusion process is exactly what you would likely expect at this point starting with sort of a noisy audio sample. And over a lot of steps, you'll use this trained neural network to iteratively predict and then subtract the predicted noise from the audio sample to generate a clean new one from nothingness. So after seeing you know, how image models are made and how audio models process, you're likely starting to get the hang of this. So let's cover the last modality here that I'm gonna go over, video diffusion models. And video is very similar, especially similar to image diffusion models, but now we need to add a little bit of nuance here because instead of just a static image, we're gonna have to keep track of both time and space, which is essentially the time or the cohesion of the frames in a video. And the space is the objects and where they're located within the video itself. And so for our forward diffusion process, we're gonna look at this example of Tony Hawk here jumping over a blue Mini Cooper by the looks of it. And essentially, our starting point is then going to be a clean video that's going to be composed of a sequence of frames. So for this visualization, I just chose five at different points of this video that was about you know 80 frames long. And so that'll look like this. And so differently from image models where it's just one image, you're actually going to have sort of almost one, two, you know, many different images that are actually in a sequence. And it's important to keep them in a sequence because essentially that's what a video is. And so it makes the most sense to represent a video as a sequence of these images, sequence of these frames. And so then following the forward diffusion process, we can incrementally add noise to each sequence of frames of these videos. So I've got that example of going from a little bit of noise to very noisy down here at the bottom. But then the thing that really comes into play here with videos is the specific nuance of temporal or time and spatial or space consistency. And my little definition that I have here is, you know, unlike pictures and audio, which are either static in the case of pictures or inherently time series based in the case of audio, generating video frames always requires an understanding of both the time and space to maintain good consistency and cohesion across all of the frames. So let's actually give some context to what this time space approach actually is. And it sounds very futuristic and you know almost Star Trek-y or something like that when you talk about time space models, but it's pretty straightforward and important for handling videos. The spatial information pertains to sort of the information about where objects and features are actually located within each frame of the video. And then the temporal information is the timing and sequencing of the frames, which sort of will encapsulate how objects move and how scenes evolve over time. And so taking both the space and the time into consideration is how we're able to sort of create videos where motion appears very smooth and natural. Without being able to handle this stuff, that's where we start to see those, you know, really crazy AI generated videos that don't have sort of any cohesion where things are sort of flying everywhere and nothing is consistent. But taking into consideration both the space and time sequence will help actually mitigate that issue. How then are the diffusion models able to sort of handle both spatial and temporal kind of understanding of the objects in it? Well, this is getting, you know, pretty in the weeds of some comp sci stuff, but few of the ways that this is sort of handled is using temporal and spatial dependencies, stuff like incorporating information from previous frames to inform the generation of the current frame, using in-between neural networks like RNNs or similar architectures like that that are designed specifically to handle sequences and also maintain memories of past frames. Also, you can design specific loss functions maybe that penalize inconsistencies across frames. And essentially, you know, this is all just done in the internal mathematical calculations within the neural network itself. What you can do is just set aside some parts that are specifically trained for spatial and temporal cohesion. But the main thing to understand is that with video, unlike something like generating a static image, 
you just have to take into consideration the objects on the video and then how they're actually moving across sort of the video frames. With all that setup in mind, the training is, you know, very similar to what we've seen before. We generate the data set of paired clean and noisy video frames and video sequences through the forward diffusion process. And then we train the model to both predict the noise added to each video frame sequence, taking into consideration all of those good things that we need to consider with videos. The reverse diffusion process is then going to look pretty similar to what we've been seeing. You're going to start with that sort of that random noise and then using the trained neural network that's been trained to sort of predict what noise has been added, reversing that and actually instead subtracting it iteratively over multiple steps to then create high quality video clips and frame sequences that can be strung together into a video over time. And as a bit of a fun exercise, I decided to put Luma's dream machine that just came out to the test and see if it could, you know, recreate something similar to our initial Tony Hawk video up here of him jumping over. So I just prompted it with skateboarder jumping off a ramp and over a blue Mini Cooper car. And as we can see, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> There's definitely some semblance of a skateboarder. The car stays pretty much the same across the, um, you know, sequence of frames in this video that we're seeing, but it's, you know, there's still some work that maybe needs to be done with actually stitching this all together and maintaining that cohesion. And so the final point that I wanted to actually bring up before we start using some of these in action is how non-noise inputs are handled. Because obviously you and I don't have, you know, like a bunch of pictures of noise that somehow encapture the meaning of something that we want to generate that we're putting into these diffusion models. Usually we just do like a text prompt, similar to what I just did with Luma or in this example with Dolly creating some real fancy stuff here. You're just gonna prompt it with text or maybe something like an image to video or an image to text or a text to video, text to audio, audio to image, something like that. There's all sorts of different inputs that you can put in text, image, video, audio, but you and I, you know, we don't have that library of noise that we're shoving into some base model to do stuff with. And so once again, we're going to get a little comp sci in here, but the process of actually being able to handle non-noise inputs like text, image, video, and audio works a little bit like this. The first step is sort of input encoding, where what you need to do is transform the media into an input like noise that the diffusion model can actually work with. At the end of the day, this is just, you know, a lot of numbers and the numbers, what we found is if you have enough numbers and using some different machine learning models like, you know, clip, which is the contrastive language image pre-training model or something like T5, which is a text to text transfer transformer. What you can actually do is transform text into enough numbers that can somehow represent the semantic meaning of the text. So if I say like a green tree, that will be converted into what is essentially a super large matrix. So if you, if you remember anything of working with matrices, maybe in like a calculus class or something like that, it's essentially just a huge matrix that with enough numbers, we can actually represent what a tree would be in numbers for these models to actually process. Changing these inputs into sort of that meaning in numbers is what's generally called encoding. And you encode them into text vectors or essentially matrices that are integrated with the diffusion models, quote unquote, latent space. And the latent space is pretty much just like that random noise or that noisy input that the actual diffusion model will start with. So something like this that's generated then backwards through the reverse diffusion process. But the noise latent space, what you can then do is with these encoded text vectors, pretty much add them to this latent space, or they call it latent space. And the latent space itself is also just a bunch of numbers that is representing the noise as a starting place. And through combining them, you can start off the starting point. So essentially, instead of inputting noise, you turn these into noise that has a little bit of meaning to kickstart this reverse diffusion process for it to then do that prediction and generate your image. So for my little generation step that I have here, the encoded input, text, image, audio, etc., along with the base noise that makes up this quote unquote noise latent space becomes the starting point then for the diffusion models or first diffusion. This isn't necessarily the most intuitive process that's happening here, but the best way to think about it is whatever input you put in, there's some other machine learning model that's able to capture the meaning of what you've actually input 
and then convert it into this starting point of noise for the diffusion model to then do its generation of an image, a video, an audio, et cetera, et cetera. So now we've got a pretty good understanding of diffusion models, how they work with the different modalities, and then a little bit about how or why they're able to process different inputs. So without any further delay, let's actually take a look at some of them in action. And just a note here is that real world diffusion models are a lot more complicated than the generalized overview shown here. You know, I've got a couple different, you know, broad overviews of the architectures of stuff like stable diffusion three medium and stable video and whatnot. But the ideas generally tend to stay the same. So let's hop over to this collab notebook that I've then put together to try some of these out. And we're going to be putting stable diffusion three medium, stable video diffusion image to vid, and stable audio open 1.0 to the test. Sweet. So hopping over to the collab notebook, this is what we're going to be doing. So we're going to generate an image using stable diffusion three medium. We're then going to use stable video diffusion image to video to turn that image into a video. We're then going to use stable audio open 1.0 to generate some sound effects to the video and then combine it all into a short fully diffusion model generated clip. A few things to note here, running a lot of these models will actually require more than the baseline T4 GPU that comes with the free version of Google Collab. So right now I'm connected to an L4 GPU with high RAM. So you will need a Collab Pro to actually run the specific version of this model for stable, mostly for stable diffusion three medium here. Or what you can do is go into the documentation and change it to a bit of a quantized, less GPU intensive model. But for the sake of this, I wanted to use the most accurate one. So We'll be checking that out. One other thing is that for a lot of these models, what you're going to have to do is go to the Hugging Face site for them, fill in some information to get access to the gated model. And then along with that, you're going to want to go to your collab secrets and then put in your Hugging Face token here as an environment variable so that you can actually download a lot of these models. With all that out of the way, first things you're going to want to do is just run a few of these first stuff to install all the packages you'll need and import everything. But the first step of what we're gonna do is image diffusion. And we're gonna be using Stable Diffusion 3 Medium, which as of the time of recording this, came out about a little over a week or two ago. And they've gotten some really good results, posted the weights publicly, so we're able to actually connect through and try it out ourselves. And Stable Diffusion 3 Medium is what they're calling a multimodal diffusion transformer text to image model. And what we can do here is actually use Hugging Face's diffusers package to connect directly to it. So what we can do is since we've imported it above, all we need to do is create a pipeline. And pipelines are Hugging Face's way of making the open source models really easy for downloading and running. So all we have to do is use the method or the function stable diffusion three pipeline and the method from pre-trained and then path over to where the model is. And we can see if we want to use diffusers, that's where a lot of this is actually coming from and this path right here. So hopping back over here, we're using a GPU. So we're gonna enable the CUDA support. CUDA is the language that GPUs do a lot of running on. And we're also going to enable model CPU offloading so that when the model's not actually active, it'll offload a lot of the components to the CPU to ensure that not all of our GPU RAM is being used all at once. But running this will download the model and all of the files. And so then all we need to do is invoke the actual pipeline that we've made with a prompt to generate the image. And so what I'm going to be doing is the prompt here is slice of life anime style boy staring out of a train window picturesque with snow covered mountains in view. And so that will be the main prompt, which if we recall what we just went over with actually encoding the prompt into something that diff the diffusion model can start with, that is what's going to go through a few of these encoding models that are also part of the stable diffusion three pipeline to be the starting point of the image generation. And so a few of the other interesting things that you can actually take note of here with the pipeline is you can have a negative prompt, which is sort of the opposite of the prompt. You can put things here that you don't want to be generated or want to be taken out. We can also say the number of inference steps. So this is the amount of steps that it'll go through to go from noise to no noise 
or a more clear image. The base is 50 steps, and this is sort of that reverse diffusion process. You can also say the height and the width that you want, and I'm using 576 by 1024, specifically for part two when we actually go to the video diffusion model section here. But you can put almost anything that you want in there that's along with their guidelines. There's also this guidance scale argument here, which what the guidance scale does is it encourages to the model to generate images that are very closely linked to the text prompt, usually at the expense of lower image quality. So what that'll do is it'll sort of limit the free range that the, that the diffusion will be able to do, and it'll really follow along with the encoded meaning of this prompt. And so we're just gonna save that and display it. So let's actually get that kicked off here. Sweet, so we can see that this is actually the generated image from the diffusion model of Stable Diffusion 3. That didn't take all too long, only about 23 seconds running on this L4 here, and this is the image that we got. So I would say this is pretty decent, more than great results given my prompt. Pretty much exactly what I'd be looking for here. So now that we have an image, let's actually use a video diffusion model to animate this image. And so what we're gonna be using is stable video diffusion image to video, which is of course from Stability AI, similar to Stable Diffusion 3 Medium here. And it's going to be able to take a 576 by 1024 pixel image and generate 14 frames of sort of a video from that. So very similarly to what we were able to do with Stable Diffusion 3 Medium, we're also going to create a pipeline using Stable Video Diffusion Pipeline from pre-trained and path over to the Stable Video Diffusion Image to Vid path there. We're gonna load it in floating 16, floating point 16, and change it to CUDA and enable CPU offloading. All very similar to what we did all the way up here with the Stable Diffusion 3 medium pipeline. And so then we're going to generate the sequence of frames. And what we can do is then invoke our pipe with the image, which we have saved here as SD3M image. So we're just gonna pass it directly into that and then pass in a few more arguments that just came from their documentation of decode chunk and a generator, which the generator is just setting sort of a seed so that you can get predictable results here. And I just have this manual seed of 42, just to make things a little bit fun. So let's kick this off, taking the image as input and then displaying it here as a video. Sweet, so that took about two and a half minutes to generate, so. Not as quick as the picture, but it's generating a lot more of these sequences of frames that we went over. And displaying that looks a little bit like this. So as we can see, it's taken the picture and now it is a video. Whether or not the video is actually super high quality, that's up for you to determine, but you can see that it does look a little bit like the train's actually moving. And it kept some of that temporal and spatial consistency with like the train actually not being moving at all, mostly just the outside and then our little homie here bouncing up and down a bit. So kind of fun. And so now that we've got this video, let's add some sound effects to it using an audio diffusion model. And so we're gonna be using Stable Audio Open 1.0 the final of the different modalities that are open source from Stability AI. And this one's going to be able to generate variable length up to 47 seconds of stereo audio from text prompts. And so it'll be able to take our text prompt, generate some audio, and then we'll combine it all to make a nice clip here at the end. But putting this together, what we're not actually going to be using the pipelines from Hugging Face because Stable Audio actually has the Stable Audio Tools library that you can use. So we're gonna run that and load the model. But very similarly, we're going to use Stable Audio's Git pre-trained model, path over to the Hugging Face path, change it to CUDA, and get things up and running. So I'll let that happen. And as that's going on, let's talk about the actual generation of the audio itself. So the audio model is gonna take a lot of different keyword arguments here, but the main ones that we want to focus on here is this conditioning. And the conditioning is essentially going to be the prompting of this audio model. And all that I'm gonna put in here is train moving noises and have it be 
0 to 7 seconds of the allotted up to 47 seconds that we have. So it's going to generate an audio file of train moving noises, whatever that means, that are 7 seconds long. And so using the stable audio tools function generate diffusion condition, we're going to pass in the model, which we're currently loading up here. And then we're going to say how many steps that we want to take. So this is the steps for that reverse diffusion process. And similar to sort of images, you know, higher steps generally improves quality, but increases computation time. And then there's all sorts of different stuff, which a lot of these are going into the nitty gritty of audio and diffusion stuff that aren't necessarily as super interesting as just seeing the output. But essentially, we're going to pass all of these in. I have some additional information here on the side if you're interested in that. And so all of this is going to come out. And then this right here is where we're going to rearrange the output from the model into sort of a stereo audio channel. So that's all that this very long looking thing here is doing. So let's pass that through. This is actually going to be not too long. So we can give that just a second while it's processing already more than halfway there. We're then going to do a little bit of post processing as well, which is going to normalize and convert this and save the file into something that we can actually display here on our collab notebook. Great. So now we've generated an audio file. So let's listen and see if this sounds like train noises. Sounds like train noises. So it did generate, or at least it made a 47 second long clip because that's how long it can go up to, but only the first seven seconds are populated with the generated noise. And then to round things out, all we're gonna do is put these all together and create a clip with the video that's been, or with the image that's been turned into the video and then adding the audio to it to create this full end-to-end -end process using all three modalities that we've just went over. So checking this out now, this looks and sounds like this. Sweet, so let's play that one more time. And that's great. So we've pretty much done everything that we wanted to do here. Generated an image with Stable Diffusion 3 Medium, the image diffusion model. Turned that image into a video with the Stable Video Diffusion image to video model. Generated some sound with the Stable Audio Open audio diffusion model. And then what we can see here is combining it together, we can make... So with that being said, that's pretty much a general overview of how diffusion models work, the three main steps involved, how then image, audio, and video diffusion models differ, how non-noise inputs are handled, and then a little bit about how you yourself can actually use some of the open source models to do some generation of both image, video, and audio. So super cool stuff. If you have any questions, please leave a comment below. If you like the video, drop a like. A bunch of different resources in the code are going to be in the description below. And if you enjoyed yourself and want to see more like this and want to help out the channel, feel free to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching.